<laughs> when life is not fair. That's a good topic, isn't it? We're studying James, James chapter 5. And uh, we, have, we have, including tonight, we have five more weeks. Is what I figure we have in this book. Five more weeks. Where do we want to go from here? Um, I'm considering the, uh, um, the doctrine of last things. I had to talk about the end times, talking about the rapture, talking about the uh, First Thessalonians, that type of thing. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, we could jump right into Revelation and put it with a, a study of Revelation with Daniel pulled right into it, where Daniel fits into it. So that would make it a, a, a lot longer of a study, but it, at least it will pull in uh, Ezekiel and some other books right into the middle of Revelation. That's an option for us. Yeah. Pray about it. Let's talk about it the next week. Let's talk about it soon because i got to start studying a little bit <laughs> down that direction with that mindset. Otherwise, we can pick up another book. We can pick up Jude, pick up Peter. We can talk about it. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father. Lord, we humbly come before you, Father God, and praise you for this night. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit bringing us into this place, uh, putting it within our heart that, you know what, we got to get off the couch. We got to get out of the chair. We got we to gotta get out of the bed. We got to turn off the TV. We could be doing so many things, Father God, on a Saturday night, Lord, but we, we, uh, we want to know you. We want to draw close to you, Father God. We want to discover your character, Father, uh, in order for us to apply that to our life. And so we want, to, we want to walk in your power, Father, which is to yield to the Spirit of God. And so we pray tonight that your Holy Spirit would guide us, minister to us, open our hearts, Father God, to receive the Word of God, not my words, not the uh, even stories, Father God, just the power of your word as it transforms our life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, James chapter 5. Perhaps you've heard on the news or radio or some other outlet, uh, social media, about a, a significant event that occurred in Florida. In April 2022, after 31 years in prison, Thomas Raynard James, his conviction was overturned and he was set free. In 1990, he was convicted of robbery and, and murder that uh, after a witness placed him at the scene that he wasn't even at, uh, he was put into uh, prison. Two brothers, Melvin and George de Jesus, uh, after 25 years in prison for murder, were exonerated and released in March of 2022. New York prosecutors withheld evidence that cast doubts on the guilt of three men in 1997. After 24 years in prison, they were released in March of 2021. A murder that, a murder that took place just, it only took four hours to solve the murder, sent Grant Williams to prison for a crime he didn't commit. After 23 years, he was exonerated in July of 2021. In Texas, after 25 years in prison, in 2007, 58-year-old Larry Fuller triumphantly walked out of the courthouse a free man. In 1981, he was convicted for rape and sentenced to 50 years in prison. 25 years later, he is now exonerated. He's eligible for up to uh, $250,000 in compensation for 25 years of wrongful imprisonment. But the money will take years, if not decades, to arrive, and heavily taxed. What exactly do you give someone who has been proved to be innocent after 25, after decades of being, I mean, spending most of your adult life in prison behind bars, wrongfully convicted of a crime, losing your family, losing uh, everyone in your life, uh, losing any dr all of your dreams, all of your hopes, having no future, having nothing but a a six by six or a four by six cell, and depending on where you're at. Exactly what do you give someone like that? Just today, if you looked at Fox News website, as reported this morning, Los Angeles man Maurice Hastings was convicted in the 80s of rape and murder, sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. We, he, he, released, he was released from prison after DNA testing re, uh, revealed that he had nothing to do with it. After spending 38 years, he is now free at 69 years old. 69 years old. 
As recent as two years ago, Great Britain's Home Security um, Secretary moved to give such people an invoice, a bill, a bill for the cost of room and board and for time that they had spent in the British prison. Believe it or not, the Home Secretary, and you may have read about this, this is a quote, the Home Secretary of the Labor Party actually fought to charge victims wrongfully imprisoned about 3,000 pounds per year uh, for however long they were in prison. This is about $6,000 a year. The logic was that an innocent man should not be imprisoned eating free porridge and sleeping for nothing under regulation gray blankets. So they are now today charging people who are found innocent Whoa. for being in prison. One article reported an example of a man by the name of Mike O'Brien. Mike O'Brien spent 10 years in jail, wrongfully convicted of murder. While he was in prison, his, his baby daughter died. And when he was finally exonerated, finally discharged from the prison, he was charged 37,000 pounds or $71,000 for room and board. Vincent Hickey, and he was released for um, being exonerated. Vincent Hickey, who was wrongfully convicted for killing a paper boy, was charged 60,000 pounds or $120,000 for 17 years he had spent in jail. In that very dry sense of British humor, he said, if I had known this, I would have stayed on a hunger strike longer. That way I, wouldn't have, I would have had a smaller bill. You know, when you hear stories like that, it just kind of sends shivers down your spine and you realize that there are certain times in this life and there are many of them when injustice is done, when life is certainly not fair. And there are other times when life doesn't seem to be fair to us, where we say, I don't deserve this. This shouldn't be happening to me. And as I thought about uh, injustice and how common it is in our society, um, and, and really in, in our part of the world, um, some places is worse. I sat down this week and I just wanted to make a, really a brief um, outline of stories that I have heard over the years and obviously and, and during my time of incarceration and hearing people's stories and all of these things about innocence and injustice and, and I've, heard, I've heard a lot of stories. Now I also have uh, discernment to be able to determine no, you really did that. Um, but this is what I have heard. Um, found out, for example, that the person, um, st these are stories that I have heard, whether in church, or whether in ministry, or whether in prison, that um, people have suffered a great deal. Um, some people have uh, found out that the person they married isn't at all who they claim to be who they appeared to be. And after decades of mar marriage, uh, or first years of dating, and you discover that this man is a, is a nice man. He, he makes me laugh. He's enjoyable to be around. He's polite. He opens the door for me. And then after uh, just a few years of marriage, you find out that they're abusive and they're mean and they're violent and they have a temper and they rage with anger and they throw things across the room and they're abusive, uh, although the, they claim to be something totally different. You end up with a dis disabled child because of neglect on the doctor's part. He had been drinking the night before and arrived at the, uh, to give birth to your child while intoxicated, wrongfully accused of, by a vindictive spouse of child abuse and locked away for 25 years to life. You lose your job th through no fault of your own. You're passed over for a long expected promised promotion so that you can be it can be given to the boss's son who doesn't even come close to qualifying for the position. You lose your retirement after working your whole life to, uh, to develop or to earn this retirement pension and this outcome only to lose it all because of criminal management among the company's directors. On and on the list goes. It can go on forever. We all have and have heard these stories of injustices that are out there. But perhaps the hardest form of injustice is when you bear the brunt of undeserved, unwarranted attacks upon us. Things that we don't deserve. You've experienced it, and if you haven't, you will. I've certainly experienced it. That was exactly what was going on. That's exactly what was happening here with James, with his first readers, this, this first book that was written in the New Testament. They were bearing the brunt of a full frontal attack upon them. Notice chapter two, verse six. 
just as a reminder, this, this attack is identified. I noted this for you two weeks ago. It says, is it not the rich, the ones who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do you see that? There were some very wealthy, powerful, influential people in their communities who were also very wicked and oppressed and opposed them who were using the courts to manipulate the, the system in order to get their way and to hold their thumb down upon people. We see this today. We see this very powerful today. The rich trying to control the entire world system in order to take advantage of the poor, in order to really take advantage of anyone who does not think, act, or behave just like them, either to get a sort of a vindictive spirit fulfilled or to gain some financial or political advantage over people. And then last time we looked at James chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. And we saw that these people, for, we, we saw them for who they are. We took, we took the, uh, the mask off and they were in verse 4 withholding the pay from those day laborers who counted on the pay to feed their families. These people needed this money to survive and these believers were, were being treated unfairly. So how should they respond? When life was to them clearly unfair. How were they to, to respond? Or, or, or to, more to the point, how should each of us respond when life just doesn't seem fair? When it just doesn't seem like I should be getting what I'm getting. I can tell you that how most people respond, the most common response, they're really the only three of them, three sinful responses that we have to injustice or injustice. The first of them is to accuse God, to accuse God of injustice and unfairness. There are a lot of people who literally hold a grudge against God when things go wrong, when things don't go their way. They understand that God is all powerful. They understand that God is sovereign. He's in control of all things. We went into great detail over that over the last month and a half. And so when injustice comes into their lives, their first response is to blame God and to hold him responsible. It's your fault, God, that this is happening to me. It's your fault. And literally, there are people who live their entire lives, their whole lives in a state of settled resentment and anger against God for something that has happened. We see this all the time. I've talked to a lot of people who are angry at God. Oh, I believe in him, but you know, me and God aren't in a good place right now. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Me and God just aren't in a good place right now. I have heard that so many times. And it's all because of their own blame that they are placing upon God for things that are happening in their life. We're just not in a good place. Second sinful response to injustice that we face in our world is not to, not to turn to God with blame, but to turn to other people and that are behind, uh, the people that are behind the injustice. And so it's harboring anger, harboring bitterness, harboring uh, this resentment towards those who have mistreated us. This too is a very common response for, or a sinful reaction towards injustice in our life. I'll never forgive that person, right? I've, I've heard that over and over again in my life as, as a believer and as a pastor. Someone who has been wrong says words just like that. I can never or I will never forgive that person for what they've done to me. I know what the Bible says. I know that it talks about forgiveness and I know I'm supposed to forgive people, but I can never. That, that, if anyone in here is in that position, we need to have a conversation because you cannot live in a position of, of, of fellowship with God while harboring anger in your heart towards other people. Now, I'm not saying this has nothing to do with trusting people. Right? A person who has been assaulted, a, a, a person who has been abused, that doesn't mean you welcome those people right back into your home. right? You don't do things like that. But to say, to, to, to say that I'm just never going to forgive you, even though I know what the commandment of God is, is to be in disobedience to God and to be outside of that grace of God that we desire to have poured down upon us every second of every day. 
So we need to have a conversation about that. Remember, forgiveness is a choice. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's just like I love my wife. I choose to love my wife. All the feelings and emotions and all of those things are byproducts of my choice to love her. And therefore, I pour myself into her in one way. She pours herself into me in one way. And that produces byproducts of joy and happiness and contentment and all those other things. It's the same thing with forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice that you choose to honor God with, that you will walk in forgiveness. And then the byproducts, uh, the, the emotions, whether those are there or not, does not determine whether or not you have forgiven them. You have chosen to. Third sinful response is taking our own revenge. It's just getting even, right? Just getting even. I'll, I'll get that. I'll get them back. They won't know where, but they'll know why. A sort of common response is is to take revenge upon everyone. Yeah, I'm I'm going to take them down on social media, right? Behind behind a keyboard, or I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm really going to I'm going to stick it to them. A common response. You know, I thought about. This recently, it, it, it's really surprising in a sense how this theme dominates so many of the films and movies and television shows that are on TV today. This theme of revenge, uh, it, it's 80% of the market uh, for entertainment these days. They have been pouring this into our children and pouring it even into our lives since when we were kids about taking revenge upon people who do you wrong. It's just a normal part of life. We have been educated. We talked earlier about, uh, I, I was raised in an environment where, um, for alcoholism, to handle all of life's issues through alcohol, learn behavior. We have to really take a look at how we have allowed society to influence our thinking with learned behavior on how we are to behave in this world, one of which is taking revenge. And, and, and dealing with other people, who like carrying anger and burdens and, and, and rage against other people in our heart instead of working through those issues and dealing with those things. The world wants to keep us oppressed. The world wants to keep us down. The world wants to keep us in defeat. And the only way to live victorious lives in Christ is to overcome those things. Does that make sense? Yeah. A lot of movies. This is the theme that is out there because there's, there is within every human heart a desire to exact revenge. Remember, we talked about that, the depravity of man, the depravity of woman. We are born with an innate passion, an innate desire to do what's right for me. I don't care about you. I'm only going to use you. I'm only going to love you. I'm only going to care about you as long as I get something out of it. We don't know that's what it is. You know, when we're kids and we're growing up and we're, we have friends and we have all these things going on, the, behind all of that is a sinful passion to pursue what's in it for me. We just don't know that's what it is. And so there is within every single one of us this innate desire to exact revenge, to get my pound of flesh on everyone who has treated me in a way that I don't believe I deserved. Now, all of those three are absolutely the wrong ways to respond. And in James chapter 5, verse 7 through 12, James tells us exactly how it is that we should respond when life is not fair. When injustice comes to us, how should we respond? Let me read it for you. James chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. Therefore, therefore obviously connects us back to the verses before. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until he gets the early and late rains. You too be patient, strengthening your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, who count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under judgment. There's a lot in that. We'll try to get through it in the next five weeks. But notice, we'll try. We'll, notice verse 7. 
It begins with the word therefore. <clears throat> James is about to apply to the brethren, he says in verse 7, what he has described in the first six verses. He's saying, in light of the sinful attacks leveled against you by the wicked, filthy, rich, and powerful who are using the court systems to destroy your lives, here's how I want you to respond. The basic connection between verses 1 through 6 and 7 through 12 is this. Verse 1 through 6 describes the injustices that the wicked, rich, and powerful have caused in the lives of the first century Christians. Verses 7 through 12 gives us the flip side, how the righteous should respond. He, he says, basically, we should wait in the, in the patience for the coming of the Lord. The wicked will be judged. There will be a day when all things will be made right. So be patient. Describing the connection of these first 12 verses, John Blatchard, he said this. He said, in the opening six verses of this chapter, James has been exposing the ch and challenging the lives of the wealthy, ungodly men who defrauded and persecuted the poor and who lived in self-indulgent luxury. We looked at that last time. Now, Blanchard says, he turns from the oppressors to the oppressed. It tells them how they should behave under pressure and encourages them to look for the day of deliverance that will one day be theirs. This is throughout scripture. This is common biblical approach on how to deal with this issue. To say, let's, let's rehearse your uh, opponents and, and how they're attacking us. To, to go through that process in your mind to understand what's going on in your life. Why are they oppressing me? What... Uh, what your oppressors are doing. How are they attacking me? And now let's rehearse what your response should be. What We should wait for God to act. We should wait for God to act. There are so many examples of this I could show you. Turn to Psalms 37. Psalm 37. This reflects this same sort of a theme. Uh, David is rehearsing uh, verse 12 of Psalm 37. David is rehearsing the reality that we do face opposition. We face oppression. We face the wicked. And we know that scripture says that anyone who chooses to live righteously, live, that their life as a pattern of life reflects a righteous lifestyle. Anyone who chooses to live a manner worthy of the gospel will suffer persecution. We know that. And so if we choose to live for Christ in today's world where the church is being persecuted more and more and more, we will be persecuted. All these people who are out to hurt and do us injustice. Notice verse 12. Here's the wicked. The wicked, they plot against the righteous and gnash at them with their teeth. They plot. I mean, that's a, that's a powerful word. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. Verse 14, the wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow. That, that implies that they are utilizing all of their resources. They are, they are prepared. They're ready to move out. The sword is already out of the sheath. The bow is already bent. They're already engaged in, in because the, the, before that they already plotted, right? They already have their plan of attack. They have already put forth their way in which to bring us down, to bring godly people down, and they bent their bow, to cast down the afflicted and the needy, to slay those who are upright in conduct. See, because upright in conduct implies that you have a flashlight shining upon their sinful lifestyle, and they don't like that. They don't like it when our life, our uprightness, uh, shines a light upon their sinfulness. And when that happens, they gnash their teeth, they plot, because they can't have that. They have to destroy. What does it say? They have to slay, they have to kill. That's the place in the plan of the wicked. But what's our temptation in response to that? When we see those who are prospering in our world, who, who thumb their nose at our faith, and perhaps in some circumstances attack the attacks that we uh, endure or get very personal, they get very personal. Sometimes it's our family who are doing these attacks. It's our brothers, our sisters, our kids, our parents. It's, it's those whom we trust and who we love and spent uh, decades with, perhaps, that are the ones bringing the assaults our way. And so it can get very personal. How are we, to, how are we tempted to respond? Look at verse 1. 
verse 1. It says, we're, we're tempted to fret because of evildoers. We're tempted to be envious towards them. Notice verse 7 again. In, in the middle of verse 7, it says, we're tempted to fret because of him who prospers in his way. My life isn't where it should be, and why are these guys who, are, who live such sinful lifestyle, they don't care about people. Why are they the ones who are getting all the money? Why are they the ones that have such an easy life? And, and to worry about them because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. That's our temptation, to respond in, in one of two ways, either to worry or to envy. To worry or to envy. And what's the solution? Verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. This idea of rest has, has the idea of a nursing baby in the arms of a mother. The protection, the comfort, there's no fear there. there there's no concern about um, you know, harm. There's, there's just provision. There's just comfort. And, uh, the scripture talks about being under the shadow or under the wings of an eagle and, and, and God being the eagle, right? And we're underneath the wings of our God, right? The protection, the shelter of our God. That's this idea of resting, resting from all of the worries of this world. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not, it says seek, do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. Leads only to evil doing. How can you have that kind of an attitude? How can you have that kind of attitude? How can you face injustice like that? Well, look at the next verse, verse 9. For evil doers will be cut off. For those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. Yet a little while and wicked men will be no more. You will look carefully for his place. Where is he at? And he will not be found there. David says, just think for a moment about the end of those who oppose you. Remember that in the end of the story, the end of the story has not yet happened to them yet. The end of the story is not yet written into the book for them yet. In verse 15. You see the same point made. The wicked. The wicked sword will enter into their own heart and their bows will be broken or the bows will be broken. Verse 20. The wicked will perish and enemies of the Lord will be like the grassy flowers of the pasture. They will vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Powerful. In verse 37. Mark, identify the blameless man. Behold the upright man. For the man of peace will have posterity. He will have a future. He will have an end that is good. But transgressors will be altogether destroyed. The posterity, the future of the wicked will be cut off. This is the constant theme, the constant message of scripture. If you want to deal with injustice in this life, and you will have that, don't bother looking for justice here. It's not going to happen. Look to the future. There's justice coming for us. The Lord is coming and the sword is in his hand. And that's exactly the message that James has. Turn back to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 7 through 12. He, ad he identifies for us here <clears throat> our, prosper, our, our proper response to life's injustice. <clears throat> in fact, he identifies five he identifies five different responses that you and I should have when life isn't fair, when injustices happen. And you'll notice that there are five imperatives. There's five commands. Each of those commands tells us exactly how we should respond to the unfairness of life. Now, I want to spend all of our time today, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> all of our time today on the first one. We'll only get through the first one today. First response to injustice because it's the focus of the passage. And it's absolutely foundational. When life isn't, isn't fair, and, and I want you to think for a moment about your own life. Think about injustices that you have suffered, things that you have gone through in life, things that you've suffered through where you felt that, you know, that's, that's you know, I, I didn't instigate that. I didn't bring that on upon me. 
It just wasn't fair. And we carry those with us throughout life. They're very hard to let go of. They are. We got to deal with those things. We got to work through that. It's a long process. There's a lot of forgiving. There's a lot of healing that has to take place. But it's a process. We have to. We can't have this mindset that okay, I, I, it's, I dealt with it one. It's never going to come up again. No, it's a process. We have to keep on managing these things that have that have happened over our lifetime, because you can you can work on forgiveness with people, and then 20 years later, here it is again. It can just pop up into your mind, and then you got to work through that thing all over again. And so it's a process in this life. But you'll notice that uh, when you think about that, when life isn't fair, our, res our response should be this. Be patient until the Lord comes. Be patient until the Lord comes. Notice verse 7. <clears throat> be patient, brethren. And by the way, this is another strong argument. Remember two weeks ago in verses 1 through 6, referring that the 1 through 6 is referring to unbelieving, rich, and powerful people who are oppressing Christians. It's not speaking to Christian rich. It's, not, it's talking to unbelievers. Because if we're talking about Christians in verse 1 through 6, then what would James' practical application be? If he was talking to Christians in verse 1 through 6, his practical application, if those were Christians... In verses 1 through 6, primarily, he's, he's not going to apply that by saying, be patient. Right? He's got, the application is going to be, repent. Get your heart right. Mourn. Mourn over your depravity. Mourn over your sinfulness. Just like he says back in James chapter 4. So it's very clear here that this is a transition. Verse 1 through 6 addresses is addressed to unbelievers, wicked unbelievers who were oppressing Christians. And verse 7, uh, 7 through 14, we're now talking to Christians. And he says to them, be patient. Why? Because we have the ability in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in long suffering, to walk in patience. We have the ability now that we are in Christ to do that. Now, there are, are, are there are a couple words in the New Testament for patience. It's, this one is usually translated as patience, and it refers to being patient with people. That's what it, it, that's what it means. The other word for patient occurs later, in, down in verse 11. It, it's translated endurance. Uh, it means endurance, enduring bad circumstances. That's what it means. So patience is being patient with people, and endurance is enduring difficult circumstances. One is dealing with people, and the other one is dealing with circumstances. Now, what does this word patient mean? We are to be patient. Well, it's the opposite of being short-tempered. The opposite of being short-tempered. It, it literally is being long-tempered. Uh, Edmund Herbert, in his commentary, he wrote this. He said, it's an attitude of self-restraint that enables one to refrain from hasty retaliation in the face of provocation. Self-restraint. The noun form of this word is often translated as long-suffering. To suffer long without responding in revenge or, or retaliation. So obviously implied in this be patient is you don't have the right to take revenge. You don't have the right to take revenge. And we'll discover that taking revenge is usurping God's authority. Because we are not to take revenge. Part of being patient means don't try to get even. Don't try to settle the score. Don't try to settle uh, the injustice here. You remember Paul's words in Romans 12 verse 19. He said, never take your own revenge. Beloved, behold or, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay it, says the Lord. That's a beautiful thing to know that our Father, will he, he has our back. He is the one that's going to take revenge. In his time and on, in his way, he is the one who is going to deal with those who have oppressed us. Never take your own revenge. Instead, James says we are to instead take, um, instead of taking revenge, instead of getting even, we are to bear with them. We are to bear with them. We are to suffer long in the same way that God suffers long with people. Now, there are two contexts in which you and I need to be patient uh, with the injustice that comes to us uh, from others, uh, or, or let me put it a different way. Injustice comes to us in two, di 
two, for two different reasons. When you and I suffer in life, when you and I suffer injustice in life, it comes from one or two reasons. Number one, it comes simply out of the overflow of the fallenness of people. It just simply comes from the overflow of the fallenness, the depravity, the sinfulness of people. In other words, it's not that you were being persecuted for your faith. It's not that you were living righteously. It's not anything like that. It's simply that you, were, you are hanging out with, you are around people who are fallen, who are living, uh, dealing with sinful cravings from within. And that fall, fallenness has overflown into your life and it spills out into your life in injustice. People are just being people. A jerk is just being a jerk, right? At the end of the day, their sinfulness, their lifestyle, their behavior, their character, their whoever, whatever they are, is just you're in close proximity, and because of your involvement with them, because of your, uh, sometimes it just happens to be you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, but a lot of times we put ourselves in the wrong place for a reason. We hang out with ungodly people. We hang out in places we shouldn't be. We hang out with, with girls and, and relationships that we shouldn't be in. We don't protect ourselves. We don't, we don't create that, that place where I'm not going to allow myself into a position to be tempted or led astray. Instead, we put ourselves in a position to be influenced and to be victimized. And so it just spills over into our life. You remember Paul said in Titus 3.3, 3, he said, unbelievers are hateful and hating one another. This used to be us prior to Christ. Yeah. Unbelievers, ungodly people are hateful and hate one another. He's saying that unbelievers hate one another. They hate everybody because everybody stands in their way of them getting their own will right? We studied that a few months ago. Conflict, the reason conflict is there is because somebody's standing in your way of you satisfying whatever it is you want to get out of life. And, and so you're going to battle with them because they're, they're blocking you. And so you and I can sometimes suffer injustice simply because we live in a fallen world and fallen people are prone to injustice because they're prone to promote themselves and to promote hate. Turn back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Notice verse 18. <clears throat> Here we have injustice like that. Injustice that is simply the overflow of someone else's fallenness and we get hurt by it verse 18 Peter is talking about how we how we are to respond submissively in the midst of suffering and he says in verse 18 servants be submissive to your masters with all respect not only to those who are good and gentle but also to those who are unreasonable and now the Greek word for um, <clears throat> unreasonable is the word uh, scolios you recognize that word Scoliosis is a word that's used to describe the curvature of the back or the spine, right? It's a word that means crooked, right? He says, I want you to submit yourselves and be respectful to those over you who are crooked, who are unreasonable, who are wicked. Changes it a little bit, doesn't it? Verse 19, for this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly, for what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience, but if you do what is right? In other words, if you're just doing what you're supposed to do, and in this case, your employer, uh, let, let's apply it to modern terms, your employer who is a wicked person, and, and you get treated unjustly because of that, and you suffer for it patiently, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. The Sometimes... Injustices come into our lives simply as an overflow of the fallenness of the people around us. But sometimes, secondly, sometimes injustices come into our lives deliberately and purposely because of our faith, because of who we are, because we are Christian, because of who we believe in, because of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, <clears throat> verse 10. Injustice comes into our life deliberately sometimes, purposeful by people uh, because of who we are. Jesus addresses this form of injustice that can come to believers. Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Um, here, here's not just the overflow of somebody's followness of affecting our lives, pouring into our lives. It's intentional. It's intentional, designed to get at us, designed to pick at us because of our righteousness, because of whom we belong to. There are people in our lives, there are people close to us, sometimes that um, say things to us and do things to us because of who we are, because of our, our Lord, because we represent Christ, because we put forth effort to yield to the Spirit of God and walk in a way that is different than how we used to walk. And they want us to walk like we used to so that they can be okay with their own sin. It's not just the overflow of somebody's fallenness in our lives. Not always. This is intentional. Uh, verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. There's our disposition. For your reward is in heaven. Your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, just like them, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Sometimes we go through stuff in life and we say, God, why is this happening to me as if I'm the only one? You know, it's interesting. We don't encounter a lot of physical persecution. We don't. In fact, none that I, none that I have ever encountered, and perhaps you haven't either. Perhaps um, a, few have, a few have been pushed and shoved and, uh, during the process of maybe open-air preaching or uh, street preaching, whatever. But largely, the persecution that, that we endure is what? It's verbal. It's verbal. It's just like Jesus said here. It's insults. It's saying all kinds of evil against you because of me. It's verbal. And this is how injustice comes at us. Because we are not yet in a society that will allow or tolerate physical abuse. It's coming. Mm -hmm. It's coming, and it's coming very quickly. It's happening, obviously, in other countries. And, the, and you will notice that the United States is not standing up, speaking against, or saying anything about the persecutions that are physical in other, uh, other countries. We're not saying a word, right? Isn't that how it happens? Mm -hmm. You get so saturated with it that it becomes the norm. And then when it begins to happen within your home, it's just normal practice. Physical persecution is coming. It's coming. But largely, it's verbal for us today. It's insults. It's saying all kind of evil against you because of me. And it either comes from the overflow of the sinfulness, the fallenness, the depravity of the people that are around us, or it comes because of our faith. But either way, we are to respond with patience. Either way, no matter how it comes into our lives, we are to respond with patience. Why? Who do we belong to? We, we don't take God's throne. We don't kick him off the throne and say, I'm going to handle things my way. I think all of a sudden now I have the intelligence and the wisdom to make choices on how to deal with people. God, you take it. You just go take a break. This is your seventh day rest. Let me handle it from here on. Right? We can't do that. We are servants of Jesus Christ. We must bow and yield before our master. If you're in a battle, you don't go, if, if all of the soldiers are running out doing their own thing, they're never going to win a war. When they see the enemy approaching, they go to the commander. They report to the commander. The, the, he's the one who's going to instruct the war. We have to stop trying to fight all of our causes under our own power and our own strength. The Greek word here for patience is the same word that's often used of God's patience with sinners. In other words, we are to exercise the same kind of patience that God exercises towards sinners. And even towards us as Christians. 
God exercises patience on me all day. All day. James says, not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, not for a year. We are to be patient, notice verse 7, until the coming of the Lord. Be long-suffering until the Lord comes. Bear with them until and in an expectation of the coming of the Lord. In expectation of the coming of the Lord because he is coming. Now this word coming, if you've been to church any time at all, you'll recognize the Greek word. Even if you don't know a lot of Greek, it's, it's the word par parousia, parousia. It's, it's one of three primary New Testament words describing the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of three primary words in the New Testament that describes the second coming of Christ. It literally means to be alongside of. It means to be alongside of. He says, I want you to be patient until the Lord comes alongside you. That's what that means. That is powerful. I want you to endure the, the, the struggles of this life until Christ comes alongside you. That's what he's saying. That's a great translation. In secular Greek, this word was used to describe the arrival of a king or a monarch to one of his cities. However, it really is more than just coming. It's more than just, uh, just in transport. It has the idea of one's presence. One's presence, the monarch's presence. Probably the best English word used is the word arrival. The word arrival. I want you to be patient until the Lord arrives. Until he arrives. That, that kind of pulls the idea of he's on his way and he's going to be present. He arrives. In fact, 15 times in the New Testament, this word um, parousia it, or coming is used to refer to Christ's return. 15 times. Let me just show you several of these. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23, Paul is talking about the resurrection, and he says this. He says, Christ was the first fruits of, of the resurrection. After that, those who are Christ, that's us, at his parousia, at his coming, at his arrival. There's a great resurrection that is coming, and when he comes, there's going to be this He's the first fruit. There's going to be a great resurrection of all of those who are Christ at his parousia, at his coming, at his arrival. That's powerful. That's joyful. It gives us strength and courage to endure injustice in this world. Think about that. And again, I'm thinking about studying the doctrine of last things because of that. But I want to take a look at a scripture, and I'm not going to go into great detail because I think we're going to jump into this sometime in, in December. Um, so I don't want to tear this apart uh, and look at all the different elements. But right now, I'm ju I just want to talk in terms of the second coming from a position of one great sweeping event, when the Lord returns, when he arrives, and then we'll take it apart in a little more detail probably in December, January, December, Lord willing. But he's coming. He's coming. Do you feel that he's coming? Yeah. I mean, the Spirit should be moving your heart with everything that is going on in this world. And we should be saying, Lord God, Jesus, you're coming. God's coming. You're coming for your bride. Am I preparing myself for his arrival? That should be what's on our heart. Not the chaos that is going on around the world. Not Russia. Not Ukraine. Not all these other things. Am I getting myself ready for his return? Because if I feel what I feel in my heart that he's coming, then I better be right. I'm not talking about salvation, right? You guys know that. I'm talking about my, how I am living my life and conducting my life in this body. Am I living in a way that glorifies Christ? Am I honoring him in my body? Am I preparing him as a bride does before the wedding? Right? Turn to 1 Thessalonians. In the letter to the Thessalonian church, Paul mentions this. Parousia, this, this coming, he mentions it often. In chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his arrival, at his coming? See that? Look at chapter 3, verse 13. We're going to flip through a few real, real quick. You get, you get the notes, so if you don't flip, that's fine. 
chapter 3, verse 13, he says, I'm praying that God would establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. Chapter 4, verse 15. Here's the most well-known usage of it. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the parousia, until the Lord's coming, the arrival of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Flip over 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our... This is a powerful verse. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him that you be not quickly shaken. That you be not quickly shaken. There were, there were false teaching that was going around that these people, uh, that caused these people to waver in their confidence in the coming of Christ that it had already happened. Hey, Jesus already came for everybody. You got left behind. And Paul says, absolutely not. Don't waver in your confidence. Don't waver in your faith. Look at verse 8. He refers again to the appearance of his coming. Now, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Peter refers to this. And he does it in the context of some people are saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where is he at? Right? They're scoffers saying, it's been a long time. Is he coming? Really? Seriously, are you still hanging on to that one? Right? When's he going to come? Why hasn't he come yet? And Peter says, don't let that shake your faith. God, does, God doesn't march to man's timetable. God doesn't move towards what man's will is on when he should come. He's coming. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, John writes, Now little children, 1 John 2, 28, Now little children, Abide in him. Uh, the word abide means to dwell in. It has to do with making your abode, right? Dwell in Christ. Saturate yourself in him. Abide in him so that when he appears, you, you may have confidence and not shrink back or not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. At his coming. You know, I mentioned this to the group, to the men, um, last week scripture says study yourself this is a rabbit i'll try to make it quick because the girl's got to go um study to show thyself approved unto god a workman uh, who need not be ashamed rightfully dividing the word of truth right who need not be ashamed before god rightfully dividing the word of truth that means and this verse means that there is going to be a moment of time that when we get well, christ's arrival and he raptures us up into his presence that there's going to be a moment of time where we're going to be, we're going to have within our mind, our frontal lobe, a, a reminder of all that we did do and all that we did not do. Now, little children, talking to believers, abide in Him. We're not talking about your salvation. We're talking about you living in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that when He appears, when He gathers you up into His arms, we may have confidence and not shrink back in shame at his coming. And I don't want to be ashamed when he appears. Now that, that shame is going to be over, uh, overshadowed with his great love. So don't think that we're, there's no sin anymore. So there's not going to be this, this guilt, but there is going to be a twinkling of an eye to where we stand before God in, our pre in his presence and we're going to have this in our mind, this reflection, because we're going to be rewarded for all that we've done in the body, Right? There's going to be a twinkling of an eye, no matter how fast that goes by, of a moment of, oh, I could have done more. But then Christ's love will overshadow that. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to have to endure that for long. Yeah. What I want you to see, and the reason that I led you through all of those references, there are many others, many, many, many others, but what I want you to see is this event should be the constant preoccupation of our minds. This should be our mindset. Not where do I go from here in this world. Not, not 
my, not my job, not my future, although we are to plan. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. We are to be wise in the stewardship of all the stuff that God has given us. We are to make plans. We are to invest in our future. We understand that. But the preoccupation of our mind should be upon the coming of the Lord. Are you aware that some 18, 1,835 times the second coming is mentioned in Scripture? 1,825 times, 300 times in the New Testament. One in every 13 verses in the New Testament is a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. One in every 13 verses. We, our minds should be saturated and consumed by, and preoccupied by Christ's coming. The Puritan writer, John Trapp, said this. He said, this is, this is pinned as a badge to the sleeve of every true believer, that he looks for and longs for Christ's coming. Martin Luther wrote, I preach as though Christ died yesterday, rose from the dead today, and is coming back tomorrow. Is that how you live? Is that how you embrace the truth of scriptures that we love so much? Do you really think Christ has died yesterday and was being raised today and it's so much of a reality in your life that it's as if it happened today? He could come back before we even leave this service. And have you done all that he has called you to do? We, we, we are taught, all live our lives looking, looking, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Paul writes to his young son in the faith. He says, for the grace of God has appeared. Again, another all scripture is, but the, another powerful verse. My favorite verse is the one I'm studying, right? And then when you study a different one, that becomes your favorite verse because every verse is breathed out by God, and so it's all powerful. But this is a powerful verse. Titus 2, 11, he says, for the grace of God has appeared. And this is probably the grace incarnate the a reference to grace coming in the person of Jesus Christ. He has appeared bringing salvation to all men, Scripture says. That is that he has made salvation known or available to all men. Now watch, verse 12. It focuses on us. Powerful. If you're there, just watch the flow. Verse 12. Instructing. This grace that has come in Christ teaches us that is, those who have come to embrace this grace, who have come to enjoy this grace, that grace instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire. The Spirit of God in each one of us instructs us to deny ungod. Here's where the conviction comes from, right? The guilt when we, when we why do I do what I don't want to do? When what I want to do, I don't do, right, Paul? Right? When we trip up into sin, the guilt and the shame is because this grace that is empowered by the Spirit of God instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldliness, worldly desires. And it instructs us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly looking. See the word looking? Looking. Verse 13. In other words, the grace of God brought to us in Christ instructs us or teaches us to live looking. The Spirit of God, the reason you feel like Christ is coming is because the Spirit of God is moving you to look. Moving you to look deeper into the coming of Christ because He is coming. Looking is, is a verbal. It's not the main verb here. It, it's, it's modifying the main verb if you look at it. In this case, it's, it's an infinitive. We have been instructed to live looking. That's a command. Live your life looking. And when you're getting, thinking that you've got an idea on it, keep looking because you don't. Keep looking. Is that how you live? Is that how I live? Think for a moment. Ask yourself the question. Do you really live day in and day out as a Christian looking for the return of Jesus Christ? I don't mean looking for a timetable. I don't mean looking for a date. I don't mean looking for numbers and charts and hidden, hidden scriptures in, in the Bible according to numbers and codes. I mean, are you spending your time in preparation looking for the coming of the Lord? He goes on to say, looking for what? Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what grace teaches us to do. 
to live here in this present age looking. And I have to tell you, I have to admit to you, I, I, I have to search my own heart and I cannot honestly say to you that I spend my life constantly looking. So it, it's all of us. All of us have to re, kind of uh, realign our mindset because this world wants to keep us distracted on wars and rumors of wars. This world wants to keep us looking at how chaotic it's getting and how everything appears to be falling apart instead of falling into place. We need to spend our life looking. You see, in our culture, in the Christian culture here, we, heaven is not a popular topic. Why is that? You know, there are practically no songs being written today about heaven. Have you noticed that? Why is that? Back in the day, they, that's all the hymns. The hymns were all about heaven. We don't have songs about the second coming of Christ and about his return and about heaven. We don't, we don't, we don't long for heaven like Paul did. We don't long for that. We, and I think one of the reasons it's difficult the, the difficulties of this life make believers long for heaven, and frankly, we have it easy. Difficulties in life make you long for heaven. When you're struggling, when, when things aren't going your way, you tend to look for heaven a, a lot more. You know, I, I want Christ to come back, but I want to get married first. I want to have children. I want a family. I want a career. I want this. I want that. I want Christ to come back, but fill in the blank. You know, Ellen Thomas wrote, life is too comfortable and things are too important for us to want to leave this world behind. She says it, uh, it, it making it hard to sing with integrity. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand I, and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We're so caught up in the things of this world and the American dream that we, we don't look at the beauty on the other side. We're afraid to lose the stuff that we accumulated. We can't sing that with our hearts, but let me tell you, when, when people are hurting, when they've lost a family member, when you hear that a child has, has terminal cancer or when a family has been destroyed by divorce, when a person ages and their body begins to fall apart, it begins to decay and uh, living becomes work, living becomes effort, becomes trouble, becomes burdensome. Heaven and Christ returns become, begins to have a whole new look and a whole new shine. James says, be patient until Christ returns. You see, suffering people long for presence, the presence of Christ, their King. When we are suffering for persecution, for righteousness sake, or even because of the fallenness of human, humankind around us, we begin to long for our Father. And here's the point James wants us to get. As we face injustice in this world, we are to find in the return of Christ an anchor for our souls in the midst of an unfair world. He wants us to understand that in, in, when we face injustices, when we face difficulties, when we face attacks by this world system, either, even from Christians, we are to find the return of Christ because that is going to be our preoccupation. That is going to be our focus. The return of Christ as an anchor for our souls in the midst of an unfair, unfair world. And to help us understand his point, James uses an illustration back in 5.7. He says, The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until he gets the early and late rains. The earth. Now, there's a lot of spiritualizing about this. <clears throat> Talking about this has to do with revival. You know, that there's, a, there's an early revival, the early rain, and then there's going to be the later rain where there's going to be a, another revival before the coming of Christ because it has to do with harvest. There, that's a lot, there's a lot of spiritualization, and we can go on that on another day. But let's just talk about what it means uh, here. 5-7. Um, Five, seven. Now, in an agricultural society like that, for the first century in James' world, they would have immediately understood what he was talking about. The land of Israel was dotted with farms and a lot of rental farms or tenant farms. Um, this would have been a relatively poor tenant farmer. That's how this word is used. What does a farmer like that live for? 
This is a farmer who rents out land and, and, and this is all he got. He doesn't own the dirt. He's planting. And what does he long for? The precious produce of the soil. In other words, the harvest. That's what he longs for. He's longing for the results of that. And it, it, he, it, but if he wants to enjoy the harvest, he, what does he have to do? He has to wait. He has to wait. James says he has to be patient. Before he can enjoy the produce and, and before he can enjoy the harvest, he, a lengthy process has to take place and that includes the right kind of rain. The right kind of rain. Here is called the early and the late rains. Again, a, a person from Palestine, the land of Philistine, uh, which all these people were, uh, remember they originally were a part of James's church in Jerusalem, and now they've been scattered because of persecution. They would have understood this. They would have got it instantly. But let me just very briefly go over geography. You understand that in Israel, and uh, there's little to no rain from June through September. There's little to no rain through those months. Then beginning in October through early November, they get what is called the early rains. This rain is, um, it's, Dramatic thunderstorms, powerful thunderstorms, downpours, and they get them for a, a few months. These downpours wet the soil, and then the farmer can come in right behind or right in the middle of these, um, these rains and begin to plow the field because now the field is, is workable. It, it's been wet, it's pl uh, pliable, and now it's open to the plow. And they can begin to prepare the soil, and he can work the seed. Those are the early rains. Over the next couple of months, after he sows from December to February, the land gets 75% of its moisture, 75% of its rainfall. And then in the late part of April through May, they get what is called the later rains or the late rains or the last rains. These are not usually thunderstorms, powerful force of water raining. This is more of a light showers that are pouring down upon Israel that enables the crops to do what? Grow. Grow mature the second the, the late rains has to do with the work of the spirit of god on the church to mature mature the church for the harvest the later rains has to do with saturation of the ground not in a heavy outpouring but in a soft steady stream of the work of the spirit of god in order to the mature the church because what is the church maturing for the harvest the return of christ and so late April and May, they get what is called the late rains. Light showers that enable the crops to mature to its fullest extent and to be ready for harvest. You see, both the early and the late rains were crucial for a good harvest. And when they came, it was because of the faithfulness of God, God's provision. And it was evidence of his faithfulness to his people. The people were to pray for the early and the late rains so that they would have a good harvest. James' point in using this illustration is that reaping a harvest requires time and patience. Reaping a harvest requires time and patience. It started in the early rains in October, but you didn't get the harvest until the next summer. Time, patience, endurance. That's exactly the perspective that we need when we are treated unfairly. We need patience. Just be patient. But I think James chose this picture of a farmer and a harvest for a particular reason. You see, the image of the harvest is a familiar, familiar Jewish picture of God's judgment. Turn to Prophet Joel for me, then we'll wrap up. Prophet Joel, chapter 3, time is it? 710. Joel, chapter 3. You have a description of Armageddon. And Joel's prophecies, uh, he's prophesying the coming day of the Lord in Joel chapter 3, verse 12. Joel chapter 3, verse 12. He says, Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. So the nations will gather there. God says it's like a courtroom. And in verse 13, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come tread for the winepress is full. The vats are overflowing for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley. 
they're awaiting God's verdict. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley where they wait, where they're waiting for the God's verdict. Here's God's judgment is described as a harvest. And when you come to the New Testament, you see the same thing. In the ministry of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, Jesus said this. He said, his winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up with chaff with unquenchable fire. Burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so the image of harvest is an image of judgment. Do you see that? Very important. And when you understand that, it makes James's illustration much richer. James is saying, be patient when treated unfairly. Judgment day is coming when all will be set right. The harvest is going to bring in the judgment of God. And notice back in, in James chapter 5 that, that James applies the illustration to us. He, he's chapter 5 verse 8. He says, you be patient or you too be patient. In the same way that the farmer waits for the harvest, you wait for the coming of the Lord and the judgment that he will bring. You too be patient. Listen, don't expect justice in this world. It's not going to happen. It's just going to get worse. We live in a world known for injustice, but Jesus Christ will come, James says, and when he comes, he will make everything right. There will be justice one day. This is exactly how Paul taught the Thessalonians to think. Back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 4, he says, "We speak proudly of you among the churches for your perseverance and your faith in the midst of all of your persecutions and afflictions which you endured." He says, "Listen, you're being treated unjustly. You live in the midst of injustice." And he said, "But verse 6, there's coming a day when God is going to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted. And to us as well, he says, listen, understand, you're not getting justice here, but justice is coming. When? Verse 7. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in a flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming. And he's bringing his justice with him. That's exactly how the Bible urges us about how we are to have that mindset of the return of Christ. When we are wrong, when we are treated unjustly, when things don't go our way, when we suffer injustice in this world, either as the overflow of the humanness, the fallenness of the people that are around us, or we suffer persecution for our faith in Jesus Christ. Either way, there is coming a day when our Father will make it all right. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father God, that you are the one on the throne. We thank you, Father God, that we don't have to, uh, we don't have to defend ourselves. We don't have to, Father God, seek revenge Lord, Father, but it is hard to be patient. It is hard, Father God. It's hard, Father, because we live, we, we try to depend on our own resources and we try to lean on our own understanding. So, Father God, we pray that the Spirit would help us to recognize any time or place where we are attempting to take the will, Father, and we pray that you would help us to lean on you and to trust in you and to keep our eyes focused on your coming. Lord, because when we, when we, when our eyes are on you, when we're looking to heaven, Father God, then our eyes are off the world. When we're focused on you, Father God, we're not holding on to the things of this world. We're not worried about popularity. We're not worried about financial prosperity. We're not worried about how big our house is, how many cars we are, the girl, the girl in our life, the boy in our life. We're not worried about any of those things that this world is seeking and hungering after, the sexual perversions of this world. Our mind, when we're focused on you, Father God, all we care about is your glory and your honor, and we want to line up next to you. And so, Father God, we pray and wait for your coming. We look for your, your coming. We long for your return, for the bride of Christ to be raptured up into your presence and into your arms, Father God. Today, let it be so, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.